Hello, hello, and welcome back to Things We Said Today. This is a bi-weekly podcast, a conversation about the Fab Four, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, where we talk about anything that has to do with the Beatles, their past, the present, the future, their days together, their solo years, their music, their history, you name it, we cover it all here on this show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show, also known for my uh, syndicated uh, Beatles radio program called Every Little Thing, currently on 50 radio stations, and another uh, Beatles talk show podcast that I do, which is all on the solo Beatles called Talk More Talk. And I'm being joined by my two regulars, first of all, a man who's been uh, a big part of New York radio for almost 40 years. He and I have pretty much the same amount of time that we've devoted on the air, close to 40 years at uh, radio's uh, New York's uh, WFUV. And uh, he's done tremendous work there on the air, done lots of great interviews. And that's Darren DeVivo. Hi, Darren. Hi, everyone. Thanks uh, for watching. And also we have someone who for many years worked at the New York Times in their classical department, writing a lot of great articles and reviews for them. And he's also the author of The Beatles from the Cavern to the Rooftop and another book called Got That Something, How the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, Changed Everything. Currently working on a series of uh, books on Paul McCartney's solo career with Adrian Sinclair called The McCartney Legacy, correct? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hello, Ken. Hello, Darren. Hello, everyone. And I have a publication date. Oh, Ooh, just as of yesterday, um, they're saying October 15th, 2022. All right. All right. Great. Yep. OK, mark that on your calendars. <laughs> Wait a minute. That, uh, for volume one. year one. from tomorrow. Hmm? Yeah. That's one year from tomorrow. Yeah. No, no. A, a, a year and a week. You know, it's, it's October 14th as we're doing this. Right. And so, what so date you say, Alan? October 15. So it is. Oh, year. I thought you said the 22nd. Okay. 2022. 2020. That threw me off. Yep. Okay. So, yeah, a year ago, a year after the Let It Be box set comes out. That's how you have to remember it, I suppose. I see. Okay. And I guess we've revealed to everyone that this is being recorded on Thursday, the 14th of October, 2021. Okay. Right. And our show today. Uh, we're going to be talking about the audio portion only of the Let It Be box set. And Alan's holding it up right there. It there really is only is an audio portion except for the book that comes with it. But right. Anyway, so we'll just and here's talk the about, about the music. Still sealed because it just arrived five minutes before we started. But it's nice, hefty heavy package i could get some exercise done during the show maybe yeah <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to talk about as much as we can about all the music and maybe even uh the banter and the dialogue that's on uh these uh cds or vinyl whatever it is you've purchased we're going to be talking about that at length we're going to delve heavily into the let it be box set before we do that, as usual, you have the latest in Beatle news. And I tell you, the first news item could take up all the news, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. Because yesterday, we were all treated to a new trailer for the upcoming Beatles documentary, Get Back, which ran for almost four minutes. All I can say is, wow. <laughs> uh, for me, the picture is so sharp and clear. And um, it's almost like when you watch this, they're kind of building the film around another narrative of these rehearsals representing the Beatles trying to start and finish an album in three weeks. Mm -hmm. Can they do it? You know, there's one point in this, in this video where George Harrison asks, how many songs do we have ready? And John says, none. <laughs> so um, yeah, it, it's, it makes the story so much more interesting and so much more exciting to think that they were under a deadline here to put together all this music, to put together an album, and they had to the end of January to do so. 
So um, have either of you guys seen this trailer? And if so, what did you think of it? Alan? Yeah, I thought it was beautiful. Um, you know, the, as you say, the quality, I mean, this is one thing we've been sort of led to be prepared for, you know, what, what Peter Jackson can do with archival film. Um, and it really, <laughs> excuse me, looked in, incredibly clean and crisp and, uh, and colorful and uh, uh, looked great. Um, the other thing, I mean, he has said that um, he was hoping to sort of not repeat any shots from Let It Be, which I, I had always assumed was you know, probably an exaggeration since he's going to show the rooftop concert and last 20 minutes of Let It Be is, is about half the rooftop concert. Well, all the songs, but not all the stuff in between and the repeats of the songs. I mean, Peter Jackson is going to show the whole thing. Um, but there were some shots that I recognized. Um, Bill, you know, the Billy Preston sort of bopping in the room. That wasn't really in the original Let It Be, but I think it was in the anthology. Um, and there was uh, Ringo playing with uh, Paul's stepdaughter, Heather, and her smashing the drums and him looking surprised. That was in Let It Be. Um, but still, you know, if there are a couple of seconds here and there that were in Let It Be, I don't think it's a, a great tragedy. Um, but it looked great. And I, I love the way they ended it. it I mean... <laughs> It's, it's sort of as if it's a, a cliffhanger, you know, it sort of, you know, brings you up to when they're about to do the rooftop concert. And then it says, tune in, you know, of the 25th, I think, of, of November. I thought that was a good way to do it. Yeah. I mean, I loved every second I watched of it and it, it kept you glued. And they bring up different aspects of what transpired in that month. I mean, there's a quote from George Harrison where he's, He's saying we should forget the whole idea of the concert, mm -hmm. you know, bring that into focus, that whole idea, because they all had different ideas what they wanted to do. I think Paul was the one who was really pushing for some exotic location for them to do it. And um, yeah, there's just so many different angles and so many stories. It's like stories within stories mm -hmm. uh, during that month of, um, of the rehearsals for, for Get Back, Let It Be. Um, there's a great quote from Paul in the trailer where he says, um, I got it down here. The best bits about us is when we have our backs against the wall. And then John says, all we've got is us, mm -hmm. you know, as if to say, you know, if you look at the story of let it be as some people might that in the end, Hey, they did the rooftop concert. It was tremendous. It was wonderful. It was a triumph to end that way. So it's all on the way that you look at that whole period. Was it a period of breaking up? Was it the start of you know the group dissolving? Things were fractious at times, but at the same time, you're going to see a lot of joyous moments mm -hmm. uh, in that month. So, you know, it's. I think the more you study that month, uh, it's just so easy to to get sucked into it because so many things were going on at that time and what all four of them were going through and uh, you know, where they saw the band at that point and what they wanted for the band or for themselves mm -hmm. it was always changing. Anyway, so uh, yeah, it's great to watch and it's on YouTube anytime you wanna see it, that brand new trailer. The new book for Get Back uh, is a companion piece for the film and the album. And it just came out yesterday and Target had an exclusive deal uh, where the book comes with four lobby cards. Now I got my copy from Barnes and Noble and I didn't know about the Target offer until afterwards. So, uh, and I haven't even opened the book yet because I've been really just listening to the music for the most part. So um, have you seen the book, um, Alan? Yeah. You have yeah. it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really nicely done. I mean, we'll talk more about it, I think, uh, next time. Um, but, you know, it has a lot of the transcripts of, of those long discussions that we've uh, all or probably many of us have heard on the Nagra reels. Um, you know, they're there and they, um, they look like they're transcribed accurately. And, uh, you know, uh, tons of pictures, you know, apart from the Ethan Russell pictures, there's a lot of Linda McCartney pictures because she was you know, there taking shots too. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's really nice companion to 
the CD set and, and eventually the Peter Jackson film. Right. Because we couldn't coordinate our schedules here the last few weeks, um, we've been a little bit behind and we couldn't review the Ringo EP for Change the World. So our next show, we're going to do that and talk about the Get Back book. Mm -hmm. Okay. Speaking of Ringo's EP, he made a new video for his song, Let's Change the World. The video features Ringo along with a bunch of young people dancing at the location where his peace sculpture is in Beverly Hills, singing this song with a positive message to motivate us to band together and improve our world. And Steve Lukather appears briefly playing a great guitar solo. Luther and fellow Toto member Joseph Williams both wrote the song. Now, the video is a collaboration with Kids in the Spotlight. This is a nonprofit organization that provides a platform to foster youth to tell their stories through film. And Ringo was quoted as saying, I wanted to make this video with kids because they are our future and this is for them. They deserve clean water and fresh air. I believe we should leave this planet in better shape than we found it for our kids. And right now we are not doing that. Half the world is on fire and the other half is underwater. We have got to change and I believe we can. Peace and love, Ringo. Really nice video. And I'm enjoying that song more and more as I listen to it. Ringo was also involved with something else from uh, the organization Why Hunger. It's a new campaign called Drum Together. This is one of more than 100 drummers enlisted for a drum-focused version of the Beatle classic Come Together. And Ringo is joined by Jim Keltner, Steve Gadd, Alan White, Cindy Blackman Santana, Chad Smith, Stuart Copeland, Kenny Aronoff, Liberty DeVito, Max Weinberg, Simon Kirk, and modern drummers Billy Amendola, among many others. It's described as the greatest collection of drummers ever performing on one song. And a new video was made for this version, which is over 10 minutes long. Why Hunger is an organization started in 1975 by the late Harry Chapin and radio DJ Bill Ayers to, as they say, change systems, policies, and institutions that perpetuate hunger and poverty in our world. To learn more about the organization, you can visit whyhunger.org. You can check out the video on YouTube, which offers a button for you to click to make a donation for the cause. Have either of you seen this video? Yes. No, I haven't. Uh, it's really cool to see all these drummers again. And uh, Ringo was there at the very beginning just for a few seconds doing his trademark drum part for Come Together. Mm -hmm. And um, it turns into like a jazz arrangement of Come Together. But really cool to see all these musicians and all for a great cause. On John's birthday, the third annual Dear John virtual charity concert was held at veeps.com at 3 p.m. Eastern, organized by the UK rock band Blurred Vision. It featured performances from Peter Frampton, ex-Guns N' Roses drummer Matt Sorum, the Quarrymen were due to appear, uh, Earl Slick, along with many others. This show also raises money for the UK charity War Child, which seeks to help children affected by war around the world. Tickets for the concert were made available and still are at blurredvision.veeps.com. And it will remain available to watch on demand until October the 17th. To raise additional money for War Child, the new song called Dear John, that Blurred Vision recorded with Frampton and Molly Marriott, the daughter of the late Small Faces Humble Pie frontman Steve Marriott, has been released. And it's available now digitally and via streaming at openeyesrecords.com. You can also check out a music video for the tune at Blurred Vision's official YouTube channel. Really nice song. And uh, Peter Frampton does some great guitar work towards the end. And it's not the same Dear John that John Lennon wrote, in case you're curious. And with special thanks to one of our listeners, Bob Tavares, we learned a few weeks ago that the United Nations issued a new set of John Lennon stamps for the uh, International Day of Peace. And the United Nations uh, commemorated the 50th anniversary of John and Yoko's Imagine along with it. To purchase the stamps in its different configurations, you can go to this website, unstamps.org. Also type in slash shop slash John hyphen Lennon. 
Okay, I'm sure many of you collectors will be interested in that. Again, thanks to Bob Tavares for that. A few more items, a new Yoko Ono exhibit just opened at the Vancouver Art Gallery on John's birthday, October 9th, called Growing Freedom, the Instructions of Yoko Ono and the Art of John and Yoko. The exhibit is broken up into two parts, the first of which is more interactive, asking viewers to participate in the artwork. One of the pieces has a table of broken cups that you're asked to mend together with tape, glue, and string to create something beautiful out of the destruction uh, in a nod to the devastation of Hiroshima in 1945. From hammering nails into a canvas to playing chess, to stamping on maps and writing notes, there are ways to explore and engage in the works. Some of these pieces were actually done before Yoko ever met John. And the second part of the exhibit focuses on John and Yoko's Canadian connections. And the exhibit in Vancouver will run through May the 1st. Okay, a new article from The Guardian has excerpts of a new interview that Paul McCartney has given to the BBC. In fact, it's BBC Radio 4 for their new interview series called This Cultural Life. In it, Paul says regarding the Beatle breakup, I didn't instigate the split, that was our Johnny. Paul says he wanted the group to go on, even though after eight years together, they were still creating some pretty good stuff. Paul said, this was my band, this was my job, this was my life, so I wanted it to continue. And this interview will air on the BBC on October the 23rd. Any comments about uh, what Paul had to say there? I guess this is all being timed because of Let It Be. Not, not so and much with, with what he has to say as the fact that publications are actually treating it as news. I mean, yeah. how many decades have we known this to be the case? I mean, John said so right at the time. Mm-hmm. You know, um, he heeded Alan Klein's uh, admonition to keep it quiet for a while until. But w- but then when Paul brought out the McCartney album and had the self interview where he's saying, you know, he, he leaves it a little vague about whether the Beatles even have a future together. It doesn't sound likely. Um, John was really upset and he said so in interviews that like there's. Paul, you know, sort of grabbing the publicity when I was the one who quit. I was the one who quit, you know. (laughs) And in fact, he had told um, a British journalist, I think it was Ray Connolly, um, in December 69 that he had quit in September, um, but told him it was off the record. So Connolly couldn't write about it. And then when Paul made his announcement, you know, what, five months later, he called Connolly up and said, you know, I told you this and, and you didn't print it. And Connolly said, well, it was off the record, you know, off the record. That's what it means. I can't print it, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and, and at the time he wrote the whole story of John telling him in December and and calling him up now angry that he hadn't printed it. So so this is not a new story. And yet there are a gazillion headlines as if it's, you know, just brand new. I don't get it. Apart from I, a lot of writers and editors just heard of the Beatles last Tuesday, and there we are. <laughs> <laughs> I was a lot flipping, of. Yeah. I was flipping around on the television uh, and stumbled upon Fox News, and they were talking uh, about the breakup like it was a fairly recent event. These <laughs> and the people on the panel. One of them was, I think. Kennedy, who was a v, a v, uh, v, um, MTV VJ, if I'm not mistaken. I think that was her. But everyone else was fairly young, probably weren't even born when Wings uh, broke up, uh, <laughs> let alone the Beatles discussing this. Like, you know, and there were moments in the conversation that were, well, we've been, uh, we've always had the impression that Yoko broke them up all this time. And I'm like, I wanted to jump through the television screen into the studio. Um, it was infuriating uh, because it was, like Alan said, it's a non-story, non-story to us at least. So you're um, saying this, this is the first time you wanted to jump into the screen and, and <laughs> joke someone on Fox News? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, I, I, I'm not going to go there, but no, that <laughs> happened uh, happened happens fairly often and i was just flipping through and i think they had some something on the screen 
either a photo or I saw the Beatles yeah. that, you know, I stopped you know, dead in my tracks to hear what they had, what we're talking about. I had seen maybe the day before a headline and I thought, eh. I didn't even stop to receive what the article was. Uh, and then now, now they're talking about it on uh, a cable news network. And I'm like, come on, people, you know. Um, but anyway, yeah. And I also something that I put on, uh, commented on, on Facebook, on, on um, uh, an unofficial Facebook page for WFUV. Uh, I kind of like explained to the people who were commenting on it that this really is a non-story and anyone in the know with the Beatles knows that, yeah, John did break them up and it happened like this. And I went on a long uh, explanation of the whole breakup thing. And um, so, but yeah, I'm sure, but it succeeded in having people again mm -hmm. thinking about the Beatles, thinking about that era and gee, what comes out on October 15th. Mm -hmm. And what's right. going to be uh, on on uh, uh, Disney. Disney Plus Thanksgiving week? So it worked, you know. Yeah, but it's also wrong to think that all Beatles fans know the whole history of what happened. Uh, this is true. This is and, true. And you know, there's so much now in social media and podcast shows and YouTube channels discussing the Beatle breakup and all the intricacies involved. And when John said he quit, did he really mean it? And, you right. Know, right. Because right. we don't really know. There were yeah. times when George Harrison talked about the Beatles in 1970 as though they were going to continue. Right. And so, yeah. and the but, word breakup was never used. Right. So John left. Yeah. Mm. Right. What did that mean? Were they, were they in, you know, they didn't know. In 1972, for all they knew, they were going to be back in the studio working on a new album. Right. You know, there was never any, you know, discussion yeah. like you said ken of what this meant that john was leaving did he mean it was it just temper uh would he be calling him up in february 70 you know uh saying i, I was just joking um and it was really not a lot of precedent for you didn't have a lot of major bands breaking up yet mm. at that point you had a handful right. uh you know it was all sort of new uh, a lot of these a lot of bands that we now listen to as oldies acts were, you know, either on their way up or at their peak or coming together and uh, breakups didn't happen, hadn't happened really mm. that much yet. So we didn't even have uh, any examples yeah. to uh, to refer to. Right. Brian Jones hadn't even been kicked out of the stones yet. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I was just reminded of from the book that um, Jason Krupa and Ken Womack wrote that there were some quotes from George Harrison where he was referring to the meeting that they had in September where they were proposing their next album mm -hmm. where, you know, John, Paul and George would get an equal amount and Ringo would get two songs. Right. You know, he even brought that out right. in public. So, but I keep on deferring to you, Alan, because, uh, you know, I know we've brought this up a number of times, but based on your research, you seem to think that no matter what, Paul felt this was final when John did say he was leaving. Yeah, I mean, you know, it gets a little complicated, but the thing is that once John said he was leaving, there was there was still some time when they were, you know, wondering whether he meant it or not. I mean, they discussed it at that session for I Me Mine um, yeah. and uh, and and didn't know, you know, what, what's he going to do? Um, but the thing is that, that events also sort of overtook that question, um, meaning that they had signed with Klein and Paul was against that. And in a way, mm. once John was leaving the group, it, it, it kind of left Paul free to say, okay, then I don't need to be managed by Alan Klein. If, the Beatles are breaking up and I've got my own thing. I'm going to try and do something of my own anyway. I mean, it was probably very confusing for all of them because, you mm. know, John was to some degree a wild card. You never knew what he was going to do. And, um, and, and they just didn't. And, you know, like you said, Ken, I mean, George Harrison gave that Alex, uh, uh, well, it wasn't Alex Bennett, it was Howard Smith interview yeah. where he, he talked about that September meeting. Um, 
and and seem to think, you know, I mean, he said it, they'll get back together. Everyone's just being a little childish and and all that. But, you know, um, he wasn't taking into account how strongly Paul, Paul, Paul felt about Alan Klein. Um, mm. You know, and he was just looking at it in the same interview as, well, you know, he wants his um, in-laws to represent us, but we don't want that. And it wasn't just that, you know, I mean, it was it was it was a lot more complicated than I think each of them were seeing individually. And it just wasn't going to happen, um, which is a pity. But but there it is. But, you know, we're also seeing, you know, people on Facebook saying, well, you know, Paul's saying that because John's not here to defend himself. But what does that mean? I mean, John would be if John were alive, he'd be saying, yeah, I split the group you know, mm-hmm. and <laughs> because he was, uh, that was, he felt that he wanted to do other things. And so, you know, and one of the th- other things he wanted to do was projects with Yoko, which Paul mentioned right. in that interview. So one of the alternate headlines that we've seen this week is Paul once again, brings up Yoko when discussing the Beatles breakup. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, there was another Paul interview, by the way, um, yeah. that, that was, were you going to get to that? Yeah, just briefly, the one in the, in, um, the New Yorker. Right. Is yeah. That? Great. I piece. didn't get to read it. You, you saw the whole thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because all I that mean, I it's, saw it's headline David, wise. David Remnick, who's the editor of yeah. the magazine, you don't often see someone in that position deciding to write the Beatles story, you know, and he's he quotes a million people. He talked to Stella. He talked to you know, Peter Jackson, I think. And uh, lots of there's lots of people quoted in that piece besides Paul. But the beginning of the piece is really tantalizing because he's invited to a party at Paul's house in the Hamptons where Paul is showing a 100 minute cut of the Peter Jackson film. That would have been fun to go to. And then he doesn't go into what was in it. (laughs) Too bad. Well, actually, he was on MSNBC this morning Mm. on uh, Morning Joe with Joe Scarborough (sighs) and talking about that with Joe. And, you know, Joe is a huge Beatle fan, loves the Beatles to death. So, you know, it was... um, it was something for, for David to see this hundred minute version. And it was a very emotional thing he was talking about because he's, he's witnessing Paul watching it and his daughters are with him. Yeah. And here, here on the screen is a friend of his who was murdered, mm-hmm. you know, another friend who's no, no longer there. Linda's gone, you know, so he's trying to put it in perspective of what it must be like for someone like him to watch something like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he talks about it in the piece, too. Um, Yeah. He says, you know, uh, watching the rooftop footage in particular, he said, you know, I I didn't really get to see John play that much because he was standing here and I was standing here. But, you know, now with with this film, we're getting to, you know, get a really close look at at John. He said, I get get to study him now. (laughs) Mm. So. But is there anything in particular in this in this article? from the New Yorker that you found really, really interesting in depth about this whole period or, or about the the, um, the Get Back film? He, you know, he doesn't talk a lot about the Get Back film um, apart from, you know, what we've just said. And, uh, but yeah. it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's about Paul and what Paul's been up to. And, um, you know, it's a long piece, um, but it's a great read. I, I, I really enjoyed it and, uh, uh, so, you know, I recommend everyone sort of, you know, get their hands on a copy and, and, and give it a read. OK, I definitely will. But the one headline that I got from that, which got some attention, was what he had to say about the Rolling Stones. Stones. <laughs> yeah. um, he dismissed them as a blues cover band. And he said, I think our net, the Beatles net, was cast a bit wider than theirs. Not a shocking quote right there. Yeah, you have to admit but, it's true. I mean, I, I, but really. I, I think that um, although that became a headline, too, um, I think what he was saying was really, you know, their origins. Mm-hmm. Stones were a blues cover band. The Beatles did 
you know, that and show tunes and, you know, all kinds of stuff, which he says they cast their net a bit wider. Um, right. You know, I, I don't think that he was really dissing the stones there. It sounds like it, but I don't think that was what the intention was, you know? Okay. That's just my impression. I mean, they are friends. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Also a brand new collector's edition of Rolling Stone magazine features their list of the top 100 guitarists of all time. George Harrison ranked number 11. And John Lennon was at number 55. Mm -hmm. I don't know if any of these rankings mean that much to you, but that's the latest poll there in Rolling Stone. Three major passings to take note of, and then we'll get to our main topic. Uh, Patty Maloney, the Irish musician who co-founded the Chieftains, has died. Patty played, how do you pronounce this, Alan? <laughs> U-I-L-L-E-A-N, Julian Pipes? Yeah. Yeah, that's close enough. Okay. I should uh, know no. that because FUV has several Irish programs and I think I did know at one time how to, how to pronounce it, but I'm not going to do it now because I'm probably going to butcher it. Okay. Well, for now, we'll just say Julian Pipes on Paul's recording of Rain Clouds. Patty also played Aeolian Pipes on the McGear album. That's Mike McCartney's album with Paul for a song called The Casket. Patty played on every Chieftain's album. He was 83. Also, so shocking to hear about the death of Lizzie Bravo. Born in Brazil, Lizzie had the thrill of a lifetime to sing on the Beatles recording of Across the Universe. Lizzie was an Apple scruff, one of those fans who waited outside EMI Studios to get a glimpse of the Beatles. She and fellow Apple scruff Galene Pease were asked to sing backing vocals on the song, which ended up on the charity World Wildlife album, No One's Gonna Change Our World. Also on the Past Masters collection, and now on the Glenn John's 1969 mix for Let It Be in the new box set. Lizzie put out a book based on her diaries and photos called Do Rio at Abbey Road. The book was published in Portuguese, and she promised an English language version which was uh, finished recently. Ironically, Galene Pease also passed away. And this was in July of pancreatic cancer. I only found out about that because of Lizzie Bravo's, Bravo's death. Um, so both girls, unfortunately, are now gone. Finally, Ronnie Ashton, the wife of Billy J. Kramer has died from heart complications. She was a passionate music lover of 60s music, met Billy at one of his concerts, and she was as supportive of Billy's career as could be, giving him guidance with all his career moves. Having been friends with Billy and Ronnie for a long time, it's really hard for me to imagine Billy's life without her, and she will be sorely missed by everyone who knew her. All right. Oh. I forgot to mention one thing, and that's uh, concerning Paul McCartney. There is um, another limited edition vinyl coming out from McCartney 3, yellow and black splatter vinyl. 3,333 copies were made from recycled copies of McCartney and McCartney 2, and it should arrive in indie stores on October the 22nd. Okay. Darren is foaming at the mouth right there. He's going to have to get that one. <laughs> no, done, de done, done. It's a done. I don't have it, but it's been ordered. Okay. In fact, I received a uh, uh, a notice from someone telling me about it, and I thought there was a second uh, edition. It's probably the same one. Um, I attempted to order it today. In fact, online figured, what the heck? If I've got 300 what's 301 copies on uh, uh but it wasn't available so i think it was the one that you're talking uh, I, I think it was the one i ordered like well maybe a week ago um well this must be a second edition because i just got an email about it now like it's news uh yeah no i'm saying that there was like last week i heard about it and now today i saw something but i think it was the same okay uh, yellow you know yellow, yellow and vinyl black. So. yeah but you know what I'm noticing? I am noticing that it's not just McCartney. 
maybe McCartney three was the first that I really became aware of multiple colored vinyl editions. I'm starting to see that happening with a lot of other acts. Um, uh, where different colored vinyl has been popping up, at, you know, gradually over time. So it's becoming an industry thing. I'm not saying that, you know, McCartney's people were the first, but mm. the trend is uh, it's becoming an industry thing about having collectible colored vinyl or colored cassettes. Mm. And uh, the cassettes are really starting to make, uh, uh, you know, and in inroads now, I think they even have, a, have a, a portable, like a walk. I guess it's on on the order of a Walkman type player that I saw uh, tied in with the upcoming record store day on Black Friday. There's going to be okay. a lot of things coming out on Black Friday that are cassettes. So, um, but anyway, so McCartney. I know a lot of people, uh, you know, with the negative comments and rolling their eyes. Uh, when they hear about colored vinyl and McCartney, it's it's an industry thing, and it's I'm seeing it more and more with other with other artists. I think the recently released ABBA, not released, but the recently announced ABBA album, mm. there were numerous editions uh, where collectively, I mean, like four different covers for the individual cassettes. You know, so right. You know, one well, I guess coaxes us to buy the physical formats. Yeah. I, I guess with every single artist out there, especially artists of any longevity, they all have a fan base where a certain segment's going to care about collector's items, mm -hmm. no matter what. And McCartney's got a fairly decent one. <laughs> Enough so that he puts out so much of it in recent years. He's aware that there are people out there, like my two colleagues here, who are going to go out and hunt it down. Within reason. <laughs> but I don't want everyone to think that like I, I've got it all, but... It started with, you know, innocently enough when a few colored vinyl copies were announced of McCartney 3 and I bought them. They announced another one. I said, all right, I'll try to get that and add it to the collection. 900 editions later, it's like, <laughs> all right, stop, guys. And isn't it painful if you get everything but one? Oh, yeah. Like one different color, you know, it does, wouldn't that drive you crazy? Yeah, normally it would. But in this instance, I'm like, I'm just not. You know, I'm not telling all that many people that I know that I've done this and I mm. have this. I've actually made a box, uh, one of those uh, cardboard boxes uh, that you could get like, um, you know, the, uh, what is the name of There's a, a shop that you can order supplies, bags and boxes and storage for your uh, uh, music. And I ordered some some LP boxes and I have one that I've actually put a nice sign on it and decorate it a little. It's my mm. McCartney three and McCartney three mm. imagined all my copies are in there because if I put them on the shelf, it would be like the whole sec. I'd, I'd lose so much shelf space. <laughs> so it got it. Uh, McCartney three and McCartney three imagine got its own little carrying crate. Your room would look like the understock of a record store. <laughs> my room looks like the understock of a record store after a hurricane. Mm. <laughs> All right, so let's move on to our main topic here, and that concerns the Let It Be box set, which, uh, as we said, comes out October the 15th. That's, that's when this video is going to be posted. And so um, in the box set, you will have a remix of the Let It Be album from Giles Martin, two discs worth of outtakes. There's also one disc of the Glenn Johns mix from 1969. There you go. That's it. B side. Now it's going to make us jealous that he has it. And... Okay. I'm getting my physical copy tomorrow. So, and then there's also an EP with four tracks on it that we'll discuss. So, altogether, there's five discs. Okay. So, um... well, six because the Blu ray. The oh, Blu ray right. has, okay. the, has the red apple. Nice. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so before we talk about the actual music, I just want to ask a general question of when you first heard about what the contents were going to be in the box set, um, was it what you expected and were you pleased? We'll, we'll start with you, Alan. 
Um, okay. When I first heard what the contents were going to be, I mean, it, it's even though we've been sitting here with the Nagras for since the nineties, um, just looking at a list on a press release kind of makes it, it it's not the easiest to see exactly what you're going to get. Um, mm -hmm. You could see a lot of titles that weren't there. Um, uh, but also because I was reviewing it, um, I'll, it'll be in the Wall Street Journal one of these days soon. Um, I got the files pretty much the same day as the press release. So I didn't really have to wonder for very long. Um, I listened through them. And, uh, you know, it, it seemed pretty clear from the way they were pitching it in the press release, not to mention what the list was, um, that they were focusing on the Apple material as opposed to the Twickenham material. So mm -hmm. you know, I think everyone watching this knows the deal, but, you know, they rehearsed for a couple of, for basically 10 days at Twickenham, then George quit, then they rehearsed for a few more days, then they took basically a week off uh, at, while um, the wildly incompetent Magic Alex was putting the studio in Apple. And then EMI came in, looked at it and said, you can't record on this and tore it out and brought in new equipment. They lost a few days, um, which were important days because Ringo had to start filming Magic, Magic Christian at, after, you know, January in early February. So they didn't have a lot of time to waste. And uh, then they recorded an Apple Studio. Now, Apple Studio is, you know, with what EMI brought in, was an eight track facility for this. So while well, everyone is saying, well, you know, he should have done more of the Twickenham stuff, and, 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 and I say that. <laughs> um, but the fact is, by focusing on the Apple material, Giles Martin and Sam Okel were doing essentially the same thing they had done with all of the previous sets, i.e. the multi-track professional recordings, as opposed to the Nagras, which were recorded at, in the, at Twickenham and, and actually all through. I mean, those were monotapes, very, very high quality monotapes, but sometimes with beeps on them to, for you know, film cue sync beeps and uh, also the film crew calling out the slate numbers, stuff like that. Um, there's a lot you can do with those tapes and a few bits of the Nagras are actually in the set. Um, interestingly, they're basically George Harrison things. Uh, there's a, a, an outtake of something and there's uh, a bit of all things must pass. And mm -hmm. I guess they only had them from the Nagras and they wanted to represent George in that way. Uh, so those are in there. And there's a few snippets of speech from the Nagras in there. If you look on the list where it says mono, those are, yeah. those are from the Nagras. Um, and you could hear too, even if you didn't have uh, like notes in front of you saying that this was a mono a rehearsal in mono, uh, some of it is very obvious that the setting is different and the type of recording is different. Right. Uh, and you could even hear the ambiance that they are in like a huge yeah. uh, space mm. and not a, a small recording studio. Yeah. So I think that, you know, what they're, what they were trying to do was use the eight track tapes as the source of most of this box set, you know, for quality purposes. And because it would be the equivalent of the outtakes of Abbey Road and Sgt. Pepper in the White Album. Um, now, undercutting that argument, of course, is that the White Album came with the Esher disc, a whole disc of, of demos from before they went into EMI. Um, so, you know, in, in a sense, you could say, well, the Nagras from Twickenham are equivalent in a way to that. It's the rehearsing etc. The thing is also a lot of that stuff is bound to be in the Peter Jackson film. Um, and I think that they didn't want to have a lot of crossover between the record set and the film. And people are complaining about that on Facebook. Why don't we have the, the rooftop concert? And I don't know. I think it's a good thing. I think the less overlap there is, the more stuff we're getting. 
and getting more yeah. stuff is an absolute value. So, um, yeah. Uh, so there's that. I, I mean, I would have put, I would have put a bunch more stuff from Twickenham on there. I mean, I would have put Susie's parlor and I probably would have put their, you know, weird little take on the third man theme, which used to be something that they, mm-hmm. you know, played as the curtains closed. Uh, not to mention when they were playing strip clubs in, uh, in, in Liverpool. Um, and I would have put maybe their sort of weird version of House of the Rising Sun, and they have a little th- obla di obla da in there. You know, they're not very long. They're funny. Um, I would say charismatic. You know, I think it, it would have been uh, a much more interesting set if there was a disc or part of a disc devoted to some of those things. Um, but I'm hoping that they're going to be in the Jackson film and that we'll have the soundtrack of that. So that will be, you know, what it is. It's kind of tough to be critical when you don't know what's going to follow with the, with the film and if yeah. there is indeed going to be a soundtrack. Right. But, you know, the argument could be, and you could apply this to everything else, that everything the Beatles did was of a historic nature at this point. Everything that they did in the studio, and in this case, even on film, is somewhat important. And even if it's not the greatest sound quality, but everything that I've heard in this box set is great sound quality, including mm-hmm. what was from Twickenham. You know, even if you have short excerpts of songs, they still have value and they're still interesting to a lot of fans. So, yeah. Uh, Darren, how about you? Um, I don't want anything I say to be perceived as I'm not happy with the set. Um, because I am very happy with the set. How can you not be? But you could nitpick, which we do. All Beatle enthusiasts like us will do that. And pretty much echoing what Alan said, to me, there was a lot more that could have been documented in the box, in in this box set. Uh, Even the discs, and I didn't play around with timings and stuff, but the discs even don't seem like they're maxed out. you know, close to 80 minutes is what a a CD is going to hold. I think it even, I think, go beyond a a little beyond 80 now. Um, And it's clear that they didn't fill the discs. Um, And then, of course, there's the EP disc, which I'll get to, I guess we'll get to in in order. Um, Just leaves you feeling like there was a whole lot more that could have been included. Um, But then again, they were working with a fairly limited amount of songs that were deemed songs that they were going to go with and, and finish and complete and release. Mm. So how many versions of get back or don't let me down or the long and rewinding road could you get? Because that was, that's what would happen if they really did fatten this, this box set up and put a lot more stuff on there. You were going to get repeats, third versions, fourth versions, and that's fine for us, but mm-hmm. for the mass market, maybe in this case, less is more. But for us, more is more, you know, and I couldn't <laughs> help but feeling like, you know, that it could have been more tapped into. Um, and, and Alan pointed out, and I agree with him, I would have liked to have heard more of the uh, studio chatter, even from Abbey Road, there has to be a ton of studio chatter not Abbey Road, sorry, uh, the Apple Studios. Uh, there could have been a lot more studio ch- chatter included within the tracks. It's not done like Fly on the Wall, the Fly on the Wall disc mm-hmm. uh, on Let It Be Naked. Um, but then, and the other thing is that, you know, the material is not meant to be produced and made uh, into a, an elaborate production like Sgt. Pepper. Uh, or even the White Album, the whole concept of Get Back was for them to just get back to being uh, a tight little uh, four-piece rock band and for a while, briefly, a five-piece with Mm -hmm. Billy Preston. Um, So there's not a whole heck of a lot that you could uh, hear, you know, deconstructed um, with this material. So that's not there. It doesn't exist, so it's not in the box set. Hmm. Uh, you know, the extra disc of, you know, like in the Imagine John Lennon box that 
there's there's a lot of the instrumental stuff where it's just the orchestration right uh, you know that none of that that doesn't exist that's not what get back slash let it be was all about so yet at the same time with the linen boxes you couldn't be more comprehensive with so many different takes and evolutionary mixes and all that right. you know there may I be have... some fans who are wishing that we had more more in that vein you know i have to believe that peter jackson's movie there's going to be more to just the movie I hope so. I'm thinking a soundtrack album. Hmm. And I don't know if that would be, I'm not talking about the size of it. Would it be a single disc? Would it would be a multiple disc. Um, you know, they'd have to watch about, you know, um, too much repeating. Could, the general public might not buy what comes out of Get Back if they think it came out already as Let It Be six months earlier. Um but I have to believe that the movie is going to be uh, the other half of this story. Um, and I really hope that the movie does end up on Blu-ray and DVD. Uh, and I think that's where, you know, we could get some of this audio we're looking for in the box set, some sort mm -hmm. of Blu-ray package that also includes audio discs, you know, and there we get, so a, a lot of, of Nagra stuff from Twickenham and, uh, you know, more Apple stuff and the full audio of the rooftop concert in addition to the video. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, we'll have to see if that's the case, if, if the movie, Peter Jackson's movie is going to be the other piece to this big, somewhat confusing puzzle of what this 50th anniversary group of reissues are shaping up the book the pandemic didn't help of course or this mm. would be a little bit more i think coordinated yeah you know you get I the book in, coming in, out the book gets announced it doesn't get published for over a year the box set we've known is coming because box sets are happening now mm. um um an anniversary box set so peter jackson's doing a movie yeah. so we've known about all of this happening uh in just of, of, scattered over time in terms of what you said about, you know, general consumers not wanting to hear sort of a breathe in, breathe out version of, you know, uh, too many of these songs. Um, that's the thing. By the time they got to the Apple studios, a, a lot of these arrangements were kind of set. But if you look at the Twickenham tapes uh, on the Nagras, um, there, they're experimenting with all of these songs. And so there you get, you know, that fast sizzling version of Get Back, the fast electric two of us. You know, if you wanted to hear the experimental stuff, you know, what, it, what, what they're doing on the way to the finished versions of these songs, that's all happening at Twickenham. And so again, right. we'll probably see it with Peter Jackson. Um, but, you know, some of those versions would have been, uh, you know, if you're going to have several outtakes to get back, that's how, that's how it could have been done without it being boring, you know, just have a really, f the, the fast version that, that they originally did. And, uh, and maybe some of the ones where they're still working on the lyrics, you know, so, but, you know, if they, if they and, didn't want to do Twickenham because they're mono or whatever, that, that kind of limited a lot of that. You know what yeah. this, in a way, reminded me of a little bit? I don't know why I remember this, but when the first McCartney uh, archive collection box came out, it was banned on the run. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, on a pop, probably on this show, this was before I was, uh, was on the show as a host, uh, it might have been a conversation here uh, or something I read online where it just seemed like there was so much McCartney could have put on the band on the run box. Mm -hmm. uh, there was so much more there that it was almost like a sampler of what is sitting in the vaults. But yet it was still great stuff. And I was happy to have it. I'd want more. But six months ago, I didn't even have this. Uh, and that's kind of what I feel like with with let it be as it's coming out on october 15th uh you're going to ultimately be thrilled to have all this stuff but it's going to be pretty obvious where there could have been more in so mm. many areas 
sometimes I feel like this, this box set is a teaser <laughs> for the get back film. Really. It's just to whet your appetite, but it's very well done. And to bounce off what you were saying, Alan, what I'm most interested in is hearing the evolution of songs like you were saying and hearing different arrangements and what worked in songs, what didn't work, what was left out in some of these recordings that they still needed to fill, what they took out of the songs. And you get a little bit of it in this box set. Mm -hmm. Not enough, mm -hmm. but hopefully we'll see more of that in, in Get Back. It's almost like a sampler, a big sampler. Yeah. You know what I mean? Of, of these sessions. Yeah. And also, um, since you brought it up, uh, Darren, I clocked the first disc of outtakes at 41 minutes wow. and the second disc at 33 minutes. So you could have fit both those discs on one. You could have put them both together. Yeah. Wow. See, and, that makes and you could also have taken the Glenn Johns disc and then add the four bonus tracks and put that on one. At this rate, we'll have this thing crunched <laughs> down into one budget priced uh, uh, single disc set. No, it's true. And, and that's, that's a little disappointing that they didn't fill the discs up like they could have. Yeah. You know, and, and you're probably paying. I mean, I'm not going to get into I'm never one to get into the whole thing about art, about the cost of these of these sets. You know, that the people who nitpick on Facebook. Oh, I paid uh, fifty nine ninety nine. Oh, yeah, I got it for fifty five ninety nine. Yeah. <laughs> but still, I mean, when you're buying something that's got five discs in it, give me five discs of, of, right. of music in this special edition. Right. Uh, that that's I, I I you know when you're listening through audio files uh, on a computer and you don't have the physical notes and times and stuff it it seemed fast the discs but they didn't seem that fast that's a bit of an eye opener that they're that short and this is this is CDs two and three that you're talking about mm. and and four is not long at all. And what five's the EP? Yeah, yeah, five's four, four songs. songs. Yeah, disc yeah. five has four songs on it. Yeah, so these are the these are, I think it's clear this is the big minus about the set. Mm -hmm. The material you're getting is like it's priceless. So, you know, look at it, look at that, right? Oh, I agree with you. I agree with you. And the, so remix, talk of about the, the remix of the B side of Don't Let Me Down had a few minutes of, of chat before it. That was a nice surprise. Um, but they could have, you know, on that EP, I, I really think they should have put, you know, my name, look up the number. Um, it was the flip side of Let It Be as a single. I understand that it was, you know, recorded at a different time, that it wasn't from the Let It Be sessions, but neither was Across the Universe. And that became right. part of the main album. So once you have Across the Universe on there, you can't use that argument for why, you know, my name, look up the number shouldn't be there. And I really think that those remixed songs, um, uh, Don't Let Me Down, and what should have been, you know, my name, look up the number should also have been on the Blu-ray, uh, which is basically all high res audio and surround audio. I'd love to hear a surround version of, you know, my name, look up the number. I mean, that song is made for that, you know? Yeah. So. So why don't we talk about the actual remix, first of all, of the album and get uh, your thoughts on it. Um, I'll just read some of my notes here first. Um, I was really impressed overall by, by the whole thing. Um, the clarity is just astounding on certain songs. And in particular, I love two of us because you really hear the harmonies between John and Paul. There's so much clearer and there's more punch in the drumming and in the acoustic guitars. Um, certainly the, the rockers have more punch to them like Dig a Pony and uh, I've Got a Feeling and um, yeah, uh, uh, what was that? What else was it? Yeah, um, One After 909, I think. Yeah, also Let It Be, Paul's vocals are a bit clearer. George's lead guitar has more bite to it. Drums more pronounced. Everything from the brass and strings is brought up and it's so much clearer. Um, across the Universe, 
John's lead vocals are in your face, you hear the acoustic guitar clearer than you ever have before in Across the Universe. And there's a, a full sound with the strings in the choir. Um, the Long and Winding Road was like the only slight disappointment because I don't want any change to be made to Phil Spector's production. But the main thing with The Long and Winding Road for me was that I think that the trumpet, those four notes, seemed to be more distant when I listen to it. I got to tell you, it can be very misleading. I've said this before. I listened first in the car to this and I wasn't that impressed. But when I listened with the headphones on, it made such a big difference. Um, I don't know if I said I mean mine. George's lead vocal is much hotter. There's more harmony vocals on the chorus. Um, I hear more piano on Dig It. Um, for the most part, it, it was it was an improvement. And it's very tough for me. I feel guilty if I ever was to say, that a remix is better than the original because I don't have any problem with the original mix. But um, there, was, there was some improvement done uh, in this new re remix and I'm very pleased with it overall. Everything but the long and winding road. <laughs> uh, Alan, how about yeah. you? Um, I found the remix, um, a lot of what you said, you know, a, a bit more clarity and punch. Um, and, but, you know, this is different from all the other remixes. Um, first of all, uh, you know, because of the way they recorded it was, which was essentially live in the studio, except for Phil Spector's editions and, you know, some other overdubbing they did in January, um, 70, uh, but not that much. I mean, it was basically live in the studio. So you don't have them overlaying, you know, extra parts. And so unlike on the White Album and Pepper and Abbey Road, there aren't bits in the remix that come through where you say, I never heard that before, you know, because we've heard what's there, you know. Um, and also, you know, by the same token, uh, you know, with Pepper, they did all these intermediate mixes and, and, and bounce downs and things like that in order to free up more tracks. And that um, even though we're talking about such high quality equipment that you're not adding a lot of tape hiss, you, you know, you are taking a slight hit in the fidelity, but there's none of that happens in the Let It Be sessions. You know, all of these are first generation, you know, that you're mixing right from the masters. You don't have to go get, you know, undo a bounce down, anything like that. So, you know, we're, we're getting, um, you know, we're, we're not dealing with the submasters and the, you know, the copies that occur in the process of mixing an LP and pressing it on vinyl the way they used to do it we're getting it directly from the master tape so you have you know a, a, a bit of generation saving um but not as dramatic as in say pepper you know um so it, it also the other thing is uh the placements were exactly the same as they were you know unlike on all things must pass where you know he's okay on the original lp the piano is on the left and the guitar is on the right when they switched it around for the remix here pretty much everything is where it was you know there were some slight tweaks here and there but they're very slight um i mean i i a beat each track <laughs> and um so, uh, you know, I, I like the remix. Um, I really like the surround mix for people who have that. Um, again, it's not fancy uh, in the sense that, you know, you haven't got you haven't got little, you know, things hopping from speaker to speaker. None of Giles Martin's mixes really do that anyway. I mean, even on Pepper, he could have done more. Um, there was more on the original LP in some cases than what he did. Um, but, you know, it's a very, very sort of straightforward surround mix. A lot of the time, like on Get Back, you've got Billy Preston solo pretty much behind you. Um, some of the lead guitar solos are behind you as well. In other words, it, it just puts you in the middle of the room and the Beatles are all around you playing this stuff. And mm. because it is relatively simple, straightforward stuff, it's really just like standing in the middle of a rock band and hearing them play. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's really good in it. And I think 
to hear the remix in the surround version, um, I, I found it a lot more powerful than just the stereo remix. But apart from the surround sound, just the in general, the remix, you didn't find that you heard, um, you know, more instrumentation for a particular song on a, on a certain instrument in, in, in one song. Like, let's just say one song had, you felt like there was more piano or, the, or there's more guitar. It sounded like the exact same mix to you? It sounded like largely the same mix to me. It's just that everything okay. was a bit clearer, you know, and punchier, as you said. Um, right. You know, uh, it, it, it sounded a little more, like I said this about the White Album too, it sounded a little more like being in the room with the instruments rather than hearing a record of the instruments. So there was a bit more clarity, some of the things that you mentioned, like hearing the harmonies more clearly and all that. But, you know, if you go back to the original, they're there. You know, it's, not like, mm -hmm. it's not like you've never heard them before. It's just, I think, sometimes with a remix and, or even a remaster, you sometimes listen so closely, you think you hear things. Um, when the very first four CDs came out, everybody was talking about how on, um, I think, Chains or one of those songs on Please Please Me, you can hear Ringo's drum pedal. And, you know, it, it, for a while it was almost distracting. It's like, there it is. Well, I put on the vinyl and the drum pedal is there. You know, it's there. It's just you weren't focusing on it because you weren't trying to hear every single nuance on the, on the CD. Um, right. But, you know, those things are there. It's just they are a bit clearer in, in the remix. I, I don't think he emphasized anything that was buried, you know. Sometimes when things are clearer, they, it, it, you may have the illusion that it's totter in the mix. Yeah. 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 Darren, what did you think of the remix? Uh, I can sum it up in one word. Ditto. Because <laughs> both of you basically <laughs> were reading my notes. I want to know how you guys could see this no i'm kidding yeah no the disc or one read your handwriting you know, well i mean it's like it ends up looking like uh, uh and then i pick the color paper and use the wrong color ink and then i can't read the ink on the color <laughs> anyway uh basically everything you guys said um i i think it was up when we were talking about the reissue of all things must pass when i was talking about the liberties that were taken with the new mix of All Things Must Pass, uh, where some of it sounded a little, um, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, despectorized. Uh, there was, uh, but it was obvious mm -hmm. that this was a different mix from what we heard on the original album. Uh, everything was there and it was the same songs, just things were changed. Um, and that was maybe one of the more, I think, uh, an example of one of the more drastic remixes that we've heard um the white album also was one that and i had fun with that because it was all kinds of things that were happening on the white album that were suddenly very loud and a few things that you're listening for that are are, are back there or you know with let it be there's very there's actually barely any differences it's what you heard in 1970 but it's immediately from the first notes of two of us, the sound is sharper, cleaner, richer, and the stereo separation is outstanding. Now, I, I don't have the box set like Ken and uh, uh, like, no, no, like, and, and Alan too for a while, I'm listening on files, right? And, and from my system that I'm listening to these on, I'm listening on laptop speakers. Uh, and and it jumped out the sound out of the little dinky laptop speakers. The stereo uh, uh, separation was outstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're a fan of remixes, I know there are purists that don't want any part of them. They want to hear the music as it sounded. And I could kind of understand that logic. But uh, if you are a fan of the big remix, you're not going to find the big remix with uh, disc one of Let It Be. Uh, it's just really cleaned up and sharpened up the sound of the original album. And uh, like you said, Ken, it might be a better mix than the original album. Mm -hmm. It might be. I think Giles Martin has that skill 
where he's trying to please both camps, mm-hmm. the purists and the people that want a change somewhat in the mix, but nothing too drastic. Right. So, yeah, I think he knows what he's doing in that department. You know, it's still oh. very close to what the way that we heard it. And, you know, as Alan pointed out, it's pretty much the same. This right. mix. Although, you know, I, I still say long and winding road. That trumpet sounds far away. Yeah, there was. I think I have wrote down a few examples, specific examples, which I didn't mention yet. Uh, one, uh, well, actually, I even made a little note that some of the production of the Long and Winding Road seemed like it may have been brought down in the mix a bit, mm-hmm. which could be what you're talking about. But I did seem to notice there was, you know, McCartney and the and the Bear song was right in front of you. And maybe some of the production was, it was there, it's there, but it's scaled back just a touch, which again, could be what, what you're referring to. The uh, George's guitar solo on Let It Be just pops out of the speakers. It really pops out. It's great. It sounds like he's, you know, playing it in your, in your, in your room. Uh, right. Billy, Preston's, Billy Preston's organ has much more presence to it. You can actually hear the full... You could hear everything he's playing. It's been there all along, but it's just everything makes makes a little more sense what he was playing and how he was doing it. And it really brought brings him out uh, and puts a good light on, on him. Uh, one uh, little example of something that jumped forward a little more was the the Queen says no to pot smoking FBI members at the beginning of For You Blue. It's uh-huh. a little more prominent than on the original album. I remember when I was a kid uh, having Let It Be, and I didn't, I never heard that on the original album because it was being played at a tolerable level because my mm-hmm. parents were playing it on their stereo for me. Uh, and you had to get close for that. It was only many years after I knew the Let It Be album and uh, knew For You Blue that I hear this muttering in the background at the beginning, and I'm like, what's that? Well, now you can make out actually clearly what John's saying. Mm. That was one small example of that I thought was a little brought up in the mix a bit. Um, but uh, that's, that's, that's it, basically repeating everything the two of you said about, um, about the, uh, the new mix, the remix yeah. of Let It Be. But very pleased we all are with it. You mentioned Billy Preston, and, and I, it, it just struck me that, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> we, we didn't talk very specifically about a lot of the outtakes we spoke, we talked generally, um, but there is one take of uh, one after 909, where they recorded it down in the studio, and the one on the album is from the rooftop. Um, down in the studio, Billy Preston played on a real piano, you know, a, a, a concert grand. <clears throat> on the rooftop, he played a Fender Rhodes. Um, and the real piano on that take sounds so fabulous. You know, that is, that, that is one of the gems of the outtake discs for me, um, because it, you, you, kind of, you kind of wish in a way that they had perfected it down in the studio so that they could use the, the acoustic piano. Um, on the other hand, the, you know, the rooftop one sounds great and it sounds especially great in surround. And another thing about the surround mix is um, you, me- you were mentioning um, Phil Spector's uh, uh, score for Long and Winding Road. That is the way they've done it is the Beatles are basically on the front speakers. And, you know, I mean, there's always bleed through on everything, but the orchestra is more or less in the back. So you could just go hang out in the front speakers. And, (laughs) um, you know, Paul had apparently asked uh, Giles to turn down the harp on that. But um, what Giles found was that the harp and the strings were on the same track. And if he took down the harp too much, you lose you know, the strings and Paul didn't object so much to the strings. It turned out it was mainly the harp and the choirs. So, um, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I, I was wondering if, if he was going to mitigate Spectre's influence on long and winding road, just because Paul 
made such an issue of it at the time. I mean, I think we've all seen a copy of the letter that Paul wrote yep. ending with don't do it again. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, but he but specified it, the harp in there. Yeah. He didn't want the harp in that letter. He said it. Right. Right. Yeah. So um, there wasn't too much they could do about that. And, and basically the remix is, you know, largely like the original. Um and with with the surround one, you 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 do get in a way a bit more the Beatles because you can you can wheel yourself up to near the front speakers and just listen to them. Do we know who the harp player was? No. You got to feel bad for. The, I mean, here's the yeah. harp player comes in, does play the session, goes home, tell oh I, I'm going to be on a Beatle record, right. only to find out McCartney can't stand what you did to it. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't mind having a harp on She's Leaving Home and that harp right. player whose name I forgot just died uh, a few weeks ago. Sheila Bromberg. Right. Did you did we have her in the news? I that, think that so. Week? The last show. Yeah. 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 So I wonder if it, was, it could have been her again. <laughs> but I she's think never... we'd have known if she was on two Beatles songs. Yeah. But... She might not have wanted to mention it after hearing Paul's objections. <laughs> Yeah, but since you mentioned one after nine on nine, let's let's talk about these outtakes, because for me, they are more the highlight than anything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really feel like they picked possibly the best of the outtakes, um, outtakes that were close to the original, but also had a liveliness and a spirit that maybe the originals didn't have. I mean, one after nine on nine is a little bit slower than the version that's on the rooftop, but the band is really cooking. And like you said, uh, Alan, Billy Preston playing, you know, the real piano on the, the outtake there, it makes a big difference um, in the song and the overall feel. And it's such a great rock song, <laughs> period. And they picked just a, an incredible outtake there. Um, why don't we uh, get a feel from the both of you between both discs of outtakes? What were favorites of yours? Um, Two and three. Yeah. If you want to, because I have, I have plenty that I really love a lot, but um, I'll mention just a few of mine, then go into yours, yeah. Darren. But apart from one after nine on nine, um, I love take four of four you blue. Um, it has more piano than the original. George's vocals are very clear and it's just very lively and spirited. And um, it just had a different vibe uh, compared to the one that we've known all these years. Um, there's a take of Paul at the piano um, working on Please Please Me real slow and then going into Let It Be. And that's really nice. Mm -hmm. That's, that adds uh, a, an extra touch. I, I like hearing what they're ad-libbing in the moment, what they're feeling like doing, going into a song. And also, it's interesting, anytime there's a different arrangement of any Beatles song, I like to take notice of it. But um, that particular version of Let It Be, which is take 10, starts with descending piano lines. It's not the exact same introduction that we're used to hearing on Let It Be. Um, Let's see, The Long and Winding Road is the same one that's in the movie of Let It Be, but it's perfect just the way it is. And uh, at the very end, Ringo says, sounded lovely, you know? So many of these songs, as much as I love the Phil Spector production on The Long and Winding Road, when you do hear it stripped down to being just the band, it is wonderful because it's a great song. Mm -hmm. And um, it's nice to hear that. It's nice to hear Let It Be, the one that's in the movie Let It Be, that's also part of these outtakes. Uh, Darren, why don't you mention a few? Yeah, I have them separated here by disc. Disc two is uh, Get Back Apple Sessions, and I'm assuming, um, and Alan might be able to shed a little, uh, a little light on this, uh, disc two, Apple Sessions, everything on disc two, I'm assuming, comes from the Apple Studio stuff at the end of January. Not exactly. Uh, no. the, very, the very beginning when uh, they come in and wish each other Happy New Year is uh, is from the, the Nagras. Maggie May and well, Fancy. But, but that's on disc three. No, disc two. Disc two. 
morning camera speech. It's, oh, 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 actually, yeah. I think, I think the happy new okay, year one is it. Okay, um, and that is, uh, that is from, okay, there's a thing called morning camera speech. The very right. first thing you hear on disc two, that's from the Nagras. Maggie May and Fancy Me Chances uh, is from the Nagras. I don't know why I'm moaning speech is from the Nagras. And, and that's it for the Nagras on disc two. And on disc quite two. All right. More okay. On. So disc two is almost <laughs> entirely Apple studio stuff. And mm -hmm. if you've seen um, the original trailer that Peter Jackson put out last year, you see that little clip where Ringo saying, good morning, you know, um, mm -hmm. that's what you hear right at the beginning of CD two and it's refer referred to as uh, morning camera. And it says it's mono. It's a voice, but I think the fact that it's it's noted that it is a mono tells you that it's from Nagra. And uh, and then it goes into a take the fourth take of two of us. And then you're off and running through the second CD. Um, I, I always find it interesting and I, I won't do them all at once. I'll do them as I make my way through the discs. Uh, when you hear something that you've been listening to for years and years and years, and you hear it in the context of when it was recorded and how it fit uh, in, 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 in the original session, you know, um, that little bit right at the tail end on the original let it be album of, of dig it leading into to uh, let it be mm -hmm. i think i don't know who is that saying uh and now we have all the angels come that's john that's john john to me yeah. okay you hear that within can you dig it mm -hmm. and that's where it happened that's where he said that mm -hmm. specter took that little piece out and tacked it onto the beginning of let it be or the end of dig it on the original album mm -hmm. so i enjoy hearing oh that wow that's where he said it it was you know in this little bit coming out of this sort of jam called Can You Dig It, which I guess is what ended up being Dig It on the uh, original album. Uh, one thing that's pretty funny in there is, is John's slide guitar. Actually, uh, if you're listening to it with headphones, um, it will make you a little nauseous because his slide playing is it's very wobbly. It's kind of funny. Uh, you could tell they're loosely jamming, and but with headphones, it was like I had to brace myself a little because the ship was beginning to go uh, a little to the left too much. Um, a lot of what's referred to here as take 10, take 14, take 4, these are just simply different takes. And that's a little bit where I was starting to get a little, feeling a little underwhelmed because these other takes are pretty much what we know from the album, you know. Uh, you can tell they're different, um, you know, different, well, they're different takes, but they're, they're basically they're running through the song uh, in the same way. Um, so uh, reading my little scribbly notes here, basically um, uh, some of the dialogue was interesting. Uh, there's a bit that they refer to as, I don't know why I'm moaning, which Alan mentioned briefly. Um, sounds to me like uh, McCartney's got an issue with, one of his songs and how it's being, uh, how it's developing in the studio. And they're talking about basically, you know, what might sound better if it's done this way or done in a different way. And I, I think McCartney said something like, I don't know why I'm moaning. Like he's been complaining about mm. what's happening to this song. I'm not sure what, what it is, but uh, that was a bit of an eye opener. And the please, please me bit that you mentioned, Ken, was fun. Uh, but the thing that, um, you know, in the middle of that, let it be, please, please me again, studio chatter, John probably talking to himself says, come on, I only get two notes in this song. <laughs> uh, so he was either telling himself, you know, pay attention, focus, because all it is is two notes that I have in this song. Um, Get Back, Take 19 was the first one that I got pretty excited about uh, on the second CD because you actually hear the coda that we've heard on the single version of Get Back since 1969. The song ends, kind of comes back, and, and it comes back with that end section, and that's within Take 19. Um, and you hear 
get back as they were doing it. And then all of a sudden you hear exactly what you've been hearing on the single version of the song. So you're getting it in the context of how it was originally recorded. And that's what I find fascinating. Is that, am I making myself clear? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, what I'm getting at there with, you know, hearing these bits. The same as Hark the Angels, you know, it's you're, yeah. you're hearing things in their original context that were put someplace else in making the album. Right. And that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another bit here of, of speech is uh, like making an album. Sounds like they can't figure out how they need to proceed with what they're doing. Are we making an album mm-hmm. or are we doing something else here? But again, it's quick, it's fleeting, a bit of chatter, and then you're into the, the next song. Um, and uh, pretty much the only, if I'm not mistaken, the only bit from the roof is uh, the first version of Don't Let Me Down. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's in this box, and that's the only thing that comes from the roof. Am I am I right? I yeah. think there might be something on the Glyn Johns mix. That's okay. Oh, well, okay. And then over to disc. Th- I found disc three. Get back rehearsals and Apple Jams more interesting than disc two. That had some very interesting dialogue. Uh, that had some, you know, right off the bat, them working on all things must pass, rehearsing it. And it is kind of chilling to actually hear John and Paul doing backing vocals on All Things Must Pass. Mm-hmm. Um, it sounds like, like it was a Twickenham. It Just is. from the sound quality, it's mentioned in mono. And now we know from what Alan said, yes, he's a Nagra. This is a Nagra recording of All Things Must Pass. Uh, at the very beginning, George is kind of explaining to John, it's very bandy, you know, the band. So right. trying to tell John, this is what my goal was with this song to make it something that sounds very bandy. Um, George actually, know. George actually said that the song, All Things Must Pass, was very influenced by the weight of sure. the band. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Now, I don't know if it's I'm hearing it, knowing that at that point, when George would have a song, we always were given the impression that he would get like lackluster reaction from Paul and John, whether verbally or in their performance. It didn't sound like Paul and John were taking all things must pass that seriously, but that could just be because of what I've heard prior to hearing this performance. I may be wrong. Um, and um, another part of this is John kind of launching into a very rough early take of Gimme Some Truth. Fascinating to hear Gimme Some Truth mm-hmm. in the context of uh, the early stages of Get Back. Um, also from Twickenham. Yeah. And I have all my notes here. Twickenham Studio, question mark. Niagara Tapes, question mark. All of these first tracks that are on CD3, all in mono. That's your visual if you have when you get the set and you're paging through the uh, the notes mono twickenham and you can tell that this was done in a big cavernous space uh and the rehearsals continue i mean mine you'd expect and then she came in through the bathroom window and polythene pam is fascinating uh we know that those songs were worked on during get back let it be uh but it's always again interesting to hear them out of what we've how we've heard them on Abbey Road here. Uh, And then uh, one of the charming moments, uh, um, I think on the whole box, is Ringo doing Octopus's Garden. And he's he's in the very early stages of writing the song. Hmm. And I think George may have said, "Uh, what's that uh, that song that you were? And Ringo was like, oh, no, but I have something new, Octopus's Garden. (laughs) And he launches into it. And it was very charming. And when he's done... Everyone breaks out into laughter. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, Ringo's quote was, have you heard the octopus one? And mm-hmm. he starts playing uh, this new song that he had written. And then after that, this long, a little drawn out jam of Oh Darling uh, is where John, and we've heard the audio of this, John just blurts <laughs> out that Yoko's divorce went through. That you was know? all I think and, Anthology 3. That's- yeah, that's where we heard it. Well, it's in the middle of this rehearsal jam of Oh Darling mm-hmm. that uh, that John said that. And, um, and towards the end, you get uh, two more things I want to point out, and then I'm done with disc three. 
Billy Preston has his moment hmm. without a song. Is Billy Preston with mm-hmm. the John and Ringo backing him? And I looked it up and without a song was a cover. And it was a song that Billy Preston did record and put on his first album after Apple, his first A&M album. I wrote a simple song. Uh, so here he is several years before that doing it mm-hmm. uh, off the cuff with uh, two of the Beatles. And then at the end of the disc is Let It Be. And um, it's maybe Alan could uh, or, or, or Ken, you could shed light on this. It's referred to as Take 28. It is obvious that a lot of it is the version that was on the single, that was on the album. Not all of it. And then I read, and I don't know how accurate this is, on Wikipedia, where there was a Take 27A and a twi- Take 27B. And A was largely the one used on the single and album. Uh, here, it's 28. No, this, uh, this take sounds to me like the one that was in the Let It Be film. Supposedly, 27B was the one that was in the film. Somehow, there may have been some sort of editing of the two that was done, uh, you know, for the, for the released version. Mm. They are the same versions on the single and the album. It's what overdubs and production were done to those uh, that made them sound different. But it's the same version, and it closes out, or at least the, ver- the, the take at the end of disc three. Uh, is you hear that a lot of what we've heard for 50 plus years of Let It Be. But Paul, Paul also sings There Will Be No Sorrow, you know, in that version, which is not right. in the version that we've known for all these yeah. years. I mean, however they used to fly these different bits together, Yeah, you know, like adding the code of Get Back onto another take, and okay. that's what came out as the single. And here on the box set, we hear... Uh, the original Take 19 that has the coda on it. And you could tell that that didn't, that is, that ending of the song was different from what the, I'm getting conf- confusing now. Yeah. Are you following where I'm? I know what you mean. I need a but... nap now, actually. <laughs> I don't know. When I heard that take, it just immediately sounded like what I heard in the movie. I should point out, you know, the book as well. Um, which Kevin I haven't Howlett. seen. I've only had the audio files. Yeah, Darren, I don't have the box set, just so you, you know. Right. You. I just have the audio you. files. Yeah. Tell me. Yeah. What's that? Um, but the book that, you know, that comes with the um, LP set, um, Kevin Howlett goes through, basically, he takes the opportunity to deal with not only the stuff on this set, but everything else that we have. So he tells you, you know, this take was used in Let It Be Naked. This take was used on Anthology 3. So these notes sort of, um, you know, are are useful for like, you know, putting all of the disparate uh, Let It Be related releases together, you know, and tell you what everything was from. Just thought I'd point that out. Yeah, I figured that that information would be in the book. That, mm-hmm. And that's the, you're talking about the book that's in the box set, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I figured that that information had to be in that book. And Ken and I, we're both working off just files, yeah. making assumptions as we're listening. But I did look up, I mean, get back the coda to get back of uh, the coda to take 19. Mm-hmm. I was like, this is exactly the same as the single. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I just found that so fascinating that the first main part body of the song isn't what came out, but here is the coda that they used. And they looked it up online and they took it and stuck it onto another take, creating the hit single from 69. Uh, and same thing with Let It Be, a lot of the take 28 at the end of disc three, I recognized from the records. Mm-hmm. Uh, not all of it, though. That was the part that confused me. Maybe they used a portion of 28, and then I look up on Wikipedia and find that, according to the source on Wikipedia, and I don't know what it was, there's a take 27A and a 27B, and A was largely for the, for the used on the record, B was the film, and that's when I just kind of started it drooling in my mouth. And- <laughs> it does help to know, because, you know, I was curious to find out if there'd be any overlapping. You know, and um, I know when I listen to the Glenn Johns mix, 
and I heard, I've got a feeling. I knew that was from the anthology. Mm -hmm. It's the same version. So how much of what we're getting here has never been officially released before? There is some duplication. And then some things are directly from the film. I mean, Octopus's Garden, they were showing that in the film. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. So you've got, uh, to me, Let It Be, The Long and Winding Road, and Octopus's Garden are all from the Let It Be film, to me. I mean, I just thought that was the the other thing that I thought was great is that now I know and we all know that George Harrison likes cheese sauce on his cauliflower. (laughs) That's very Um, important. Because there is uh, some dialogue that kind of is picked up. It's it's on the rehearsal of Polythene Pan. And before they're going into the song, they must be planning what they're going to have for lunch. And you hear (laughs) you hear George call, hey, Mal, and that that Mal. Yeah, that voice that uh-huh. we know from Mal Evans and and other people are talking so you can hear everything but it's clear that George wants cauliflower but he wants it with the cheese sauce on it yeah so he's also that, specific you don't you don't hear it on this but elsewhere in the Nagras he's specific about whether you know it, it has to be brown rice because the other is he says a an ex, expletive um there, there's, there's on the Nagras, there's quite a lot of lunch ordering. In fact, um, I don't know if you remember the, the Melvin Records bootleg label. Um, they were once considering doing a record of the Beatles order lunch <laughs> with, with a bunch of those things. There's, there's a lot of that. Um, that's, like, that's like Nick Mason uh, uh, of Pink Floyd in the Pompeii film when the bits that are taken from the Abbey Road uh, canteen when they're ordering lunch, Nick Mason wants his apple pie without crust. Mm-hmm. No crust. Or he doesn't want apple pie. Mm-hmm. Now we know He's... Nick Mason will not eat apple pie if there's crust on it. You do. We know how important that is. To That's know. very important. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Alan, let's, uh, outside of one after 909, can yeah. you name some... some uh, yeah, I also, highlights for you. I also like that take of Let It Be with the descending intro. Um, right. You know, the thing about Let It Be is that this was probably the most bootlegged of Beatles sessions. I mean, the, the bootleg was out before the album was out. Um, and that version of Let It Be with the descending intro was the first way I ever heard it. And in mm. fact, The Long and Winding Road without Spectre was the first way I ever heard it. And so actually, when I heard the official Let It Be album, I, I thought, what did they do to The Long and Winding Road? It sounds awful now, you know, because it was a nice little delicate, introspective band track. And now suddenly it's got choirs and, you know, all this stuff. And uh, so I, I totally understood why Paul was upset about it, which I think we heard about pretty soon uh, after the album came out. Um, so, yeah, there's that let it that version of Let It Be. Um, you know, also, there was another bit of editing um, on the way to the final album with uh, um, Dig a Pony. You know, it, it started with the riff and then they all sing, all I want is you that ah. they cut that section out that I just sang. Um, right. And, you know, and that was an edit. And um, that was know, that was Phil Spector's doing, right? I think so. Didn't he want that out? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, I'm really happy to have an official release of the Glyn Johns version. Um, again, that was the way I first heard the album because the Glyn Johns version had been bootlegged before the album came out. And so that was what I was expecting. And it was also what I was expecting again when they did Let It Be Naked. I, you know, you want to do Let It Be Naked, put out the Glyn Johns version. You know, why, why do something new? And what they did sounded so sort of sterile that, you know, the Glyn Johns one was, was kind of fun. You know, he had some of that, you know, uh, you know, between songs chat. I mean, you know, more of it than was on Let It Be Naked. And, uh, you know, and it just, it just, it just worked. I always liked his version of the album and I'm, I'm really glad that it's getting an official release now. Um, 
We talked about this, I think. There were two. Didn't Glenn Johns do two mixes of, of Get Back? Four. 1970. Because, Four? because they kept changing, you know, when they changed their idea of, you know, whether Teddy Boy would be on or off or whether, uh, you know, Across the Universe would be on, you know, he, he went back and made a mix of that. And, uh, you know, he kept trying to tweak it because they kept listening to it and saying, no, we don't like that one. You know, although John, you know, I remember an interview that John did one of his Howard Smith interviews, I believe, uh, would have been late 69 because the album wasn't out yet. And so he's referring to the Glenn John mix and he said and he's talking about it very positively, although for a weird reason, um, he says, you know, this will show the Beatles with their trousers down, <laughs> you know, no overdubbing no fancy stuff it's just you know us playing and uh and and he was speaking very enthusiastically about it um although he later said that he was enthusiastic about it because he thought it would break the myth you know it's not mm -hmm. sergeant pepper well it's not sergeant pepper <laughs> that's for sure but it, it wasn't meant to be uh, in fact, it was meant to be pretty much the anti-pepper, you know, let's go back and play it all live in the studio, live for an audience, put out a live album of new material, you know, what a weird idea for a band that hadn't played publicly for three years, you know, or two and a half at that point, um, you know, to learn a bunch of songs and go make a live album all in three weeks, you know. That's kind of a tall order, even if you're the Beatles. Mm -hmm. Most bands would probably have taken the White Album, which they had just recorded, and do a concert with songs from that and then earlier songs of theirs instead yeah. of putting all the pressure on themselves like this. Well, that was the original idea for um, like in December 68. They were thinking of, you know, doing something in the Roundhouse and then that didn't work out. They were thinking of doing something in Liverpool. And the idea was to promote the White Album with some concerts. And then that evolved into, well, why don't we do something? Why don't we do a thing where we learn new material and make our next album a live album, you know, of all new material? Mm. Uh, so, but otherwise, you know, in terms of outtakes, I mean, I, I'm looking at disc three and, you know, the ones Darren mentioned, I mean, these all on the, on the box, they have an asterisk um, that shows the asterisk shows basically those are the mono ones from, uh, from the Nagras uh, and, you know, give me some truth. I mean, mine rehearsal, um, polytheme Pam. Octopus's Garden, which we knew was from there anyway, because it's in the film, uh, something. And then on, on disc two, the other version of Maggie May and Fancy My, Ch My Chances with You. Uh, mm. I didn't know that Fancy My Chances was a Lennon-McCartney song. I mm. thought it was an old traditional that they no. you know, used to like doing, but, um, but they get a, a credit for it in the book. So... Uh, Obviously. I remember um, one of Mark Lewison's books, The Beatles Live. It's listed in there that they used to do that song. Mm -hmm. It was like in 1961 or 62. And it says right in there, Lennon McCartney. Mm, I must have missed it. <laughs> yeah. You know, it sounds like a musical song, you know. Right. So I, I just assumed it was a, a traditional or an old song or something like that. Um, mm. But it fits with Maggie May, <laughs> like singing it together. Mm -hmm. But um, I just want to mention a few more outtakes that I really like. Um, in the morning camera uh, track, they go into Two of Us. And I like that version of Two of Us a lot. And also, uh, even though, you know, I think I've mentioned this before, such a slight difference in what's played on the acoustic guitar instead of what became da 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 it was da 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 At some point, they had to make that change. Mm -hmm. Even though it's a slight difference, I find that kind of thing interesting. Yeah. And then before the last verse, you know, um, before they're singing two of us, you're hearing Paul going, hip, hip, you know, <laughs> it, yeah. it creates a much more lively feel for the song. And John is kind of singing like Dylan for a few seconds. He's going in the sun. 
<laughs> so I really like that a lot. Um, so Darren, I wanted to ask you, cause you know, there are certain outtakes that are pretty darn close to the original that are really perform well. They're just another take. Mm-hmm. Like I've got a feeling. So something like that doesn't excite you. No, it does. Uh, I think maybe I'm a little spoiled from some of the earlier box sets mm. and where songs really could get taken apart. Right. You know, where you, you want to hear what something like, um, you know, an early take of Strawberry Fields Forever sounded like. How'd they get, sure. it? you know, and meanwhile, all the, all, you know, the material for, for Get Back, Let It Be is all pretty much fairly close to what they did, uh, ended up, you know, releasing. There's some differences there, like you pointed out, little nuances to uh, two of us or uh, maybe uh, how they handled one after 909. But no, I do, yeah, I don't want you to think that that, that I, I find it uninteresting or anything like that. Just that there is, if you're, if you're looking, um, how, did I make a note of it here? My, the way uh, I, I worded it. Uh, if you if you're looking for something earth shattering on this box set, mm. you might not find it on this one. Right. But there's a lot of great tremors. You know what I mean? All, you know, there's there's nothing that's going to make you fall on the floor. Um, but there's a lot of sweet stuff and nice moments, and uh, a lot of it, especially CD two, uh, a lot of it is like the alternate. Let it be. Right. alternate takes so it's, yeah that's how you could look at it the alternate uh, let it be which is um, how i tried to maybe justify the fact that we've got a little bit of a less is more situation here shorter discs the box that doesn't have as much stuff as we thought should be in there because in this case you know if there's uh, let me find a number here if there's uh 19 takes of get back and we know the song generally was played one way. How many get backs mm. do we really want in the box set before it starts getting like, eh. I know, I you know, know what you mean. But for me to hear a second take, oh, yeah. which is pretty darn yeah. close to the original and yeah. perform really well, like I've got a feeling was. But I do like sometimes what gets ad-libbed uh, in the song, like at the very end of Dig a Pony, Paul is singing in a very falsetto voice I think the other one is much better. Let's do get back. <laughs> and then they go into get back. So I like hearing stuff like that. Yeah, that's fun. Um, there's uh, one of the outtakes of I Me Mine. There's an instrumental bit that wasn't used in the final version. Just something like that. And like you were mentioning, give me some truth. I like the fact that they, they snuck in here. Give me some truth. All things must pass. And then on the Glenn Johns uh, um, disc, Teddy Boy, something to represent what they were going to release in their solo careers or the fact that they were, you know, considering doing this. So I have read that um, Phil Spector had made a mix of Teddy Boy for consideration. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So. <laughs> hmm. That would have been uh, interesting uh, because the overlap here and and maybe this is addressed in in your upcoming book alan teddy boy paul writes and uh and and the beatles work on it a bit in january 69 and then we know tapes get put aside beatles move on um ultimately they didn't really know what was going on with these recordings, especially who handed them off to Phil Spector? Well, Paul didn't. No. Hmm. Um, right. Well, Klein, basically, you know, Spector was a client. That's right. Yeah. Of, of That's, Alan yeah, Klein. Yeah. So, okay. so. yeah. <clears throat> so McCartney's recorded Teddy Boy now for his first solo album. Paul doesn't actually, I don't think, know what's coming together under the title Let It Be. You could have had both songs, I guess, theoretically, on the two albums. Yeah, I think um, I think at a, at a certain point it w- it became clear that the Teddy Boy that they had recorded wasn't going to be on the album. So he knew that he was free to use that. 
Um, and I'm not sure if, 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 if he didn't know whether he wouldn't have used it, you know, he right. Just right. wanted to do it. Um, but I think it, it, uh, it became clear early that it wasn't going to be in the film. And if it wasn't going to be in the film, I mean, it could still have been on the album, but in a way there was no point, you know, um, yeah. whereas they had the opposite problem with across the universe and, um, and, and I mean, mine where right. They're in the film, but they don't have a finished recording. Uh, so I, I, I think he knew that Teddy Boy wasn't going to be in the final cut. Mm, OK. And one other outtake, there's a, an outtake of Get Back, which is taking and Paul does a lot of ad libs towards the end. It's five o'clock. Your mother's got your tea on. Take your cap off. <laughs> All this other stuff, which I think is, you know, a lot of fun to listen to. I like hearing what he'll just come up with ad living on the spot like that. So that I found to be enjoyable. Um, I know you said, Alan, that you really enjoy the Glenn Johns mix and obviously it has such historical importance. By the way, you just said that, that he did four mixes? Yeah. Because I know of There were bootlegs of four versions, so. Okay. <laughs> just uh, based on that. Okay. They're, pretty, they're very similar. <laughs> right, because I, I know of the changes in 1970, you know, putting across the universe in there. See, now this and, is redundant, uh, yeah. but they could have put more than one of Glenn John, at least two of them, two of the mixes, two of the almosts when it came to get back could have been included on the same disc. They could have, yeah. And then we would decide, you know, where to stop and where to hit play. Hmm. You know, if we want to hear the album again, slightly different. Mm -hmm. You know, but to have both of the, at least two of the mixes, I thought there were two that Glenn Johns did, you know. Yeah. But hey, no one asked me. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, I, I myself, I'm not blown away by the Glenn Johns mix. You know, I don't have the history with it like you do. I've listened to it a few times. I like it better now only because I like the whole concept of, this is the band as they as they were, warts and all. And, um, you know, like one after 909 is the same version that's used on Let It Be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's uh, I, I think the long and winding road sounds very echoey in this version. Mm -hmm. um, but you do hear some piano parts in there and Paul's vocals seem a little pushed back. Um, I don't feel like these were really as perfect a recording for each song as what was used on the Let It Be album. But that's just my opinion there. Um, and it's also kind of interesting, since I like the evolution of songs, that some of these songs here, like Don't Let Me Down and Dig a Pony. And was it also? Yeah, two of us. They're slower. Mm -hmm than what they ended up releasing on Let It Be. So, um, yeah, and I like some of the ad libs. That's, that's, you know, the chatter adds so much. That's one of the things that I loved on the original Let It Be album. Um, like John saying, we'll do Dig a Pony into I've Got a Fever. You know, I love <laughs> stuff like that. So, um, yeah, and, and I didn't see the big deal about Save the Last Dance for me going into Don't Let Me Down. You know, which isn't even a full version of Don't Let Me Down. But, um, you know, I'm glad that it's there for historical reasons. Mm -hmm. But your thoughts, Darren? Um, I've, I've drained my head of thoughts. I'm thoughtless <laughs> now. Um, I didn't really listen to the Glenn Johns mix. Uh, mm -hmm. I concentrated on the other discs. Uh, I have, and it's been years since I played it, a bootleg LP of, of one of the mixes that was, uh, that I don't know the label, it was gold vinyl. Um, uh, I don't know which mix that is, if that's the one that they have in the box set now, but um, maybe because, and this is not a good comparison because Let It Be Naked is not a Glenn Johns mix mm -hmm. per se, but they're similar. 
And I've heard Let It Be Naked a bunch of times, obviously, through the years. And I just thought, all right, this is the least least important disc for this show, for mm-hmm. the purposes of this show. Mm-hmm. So I didn't really pay very close attention. I, I stuck with the uh, the original and the and the two yeah. out discs. Well, I'm sure there may be a lot of Beatles fans out there that feel like Alan has because many of them were brought up on the Glenn Johns mix and prefer that to what Phil Spector added. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and I actually love Let It Be Naked a lot, although it's missing all the chatter. But I just I think the sound quality is amazing on Let It Be Naked. Right. It's yeah. you know. It's clear as a bell. <laughs> it's so powerful, the uh, the sound quality. But you want to add any, anything more to what you've already said about Glenn Johns, Alan, and this mix? You know, not really. Um, you know, there are some nice touches in there, like, uh, you know, right around where they do a bit of Save the Last Dance for me. There's, you know, John is, is talking to Ringo. Uh, and he says, you know, just give me a big to give me the courage to come screaming in. That's a nice moment, you know, mm. um, just sort of interaction of, you know, what he's expecting to hear so he can do what he has to do. Um, you know, band interaction. It's it's always interesting. Um, but uh, I, I don't know. You know, it was it was because it's been so widely bootlegged, it was hard to hear with fresh ears, you know, um, you know, just like with the, the same, you know, with the, the, the set as a whole, because we've had the Nagras all this time and know what's on them. Um, it really put, I think, Giles Martin at a big disadvantage because this time, you know, we don't know what all the pepper tapes sound like. We don't know what all the white album tapes sound like, but we've heard the complete let it be sessions. And so we're all here available to second guess his choices, which, you know, I've done, except, you know, I'm just waiting to see if Peter Jackson has the things that I would have put on, you know, if he does great, you know, if he doesn't, well, you know, at some point I'm going to do, I think for Beale fan, a, uh, um, a, a wrap up of, you know, what the whole project uh, gave us. And uh, so, so it remains to be seen that the Peter Jackson is the big mystery. Uh, and, and I, and I think, I think Darren said, I, I agree. Uh, it, it's the main, it's the main show here, you know, mm-hmm. uh, and, you know, it's supposed to have the full rooftop concert. I think both um, he and Jackson and uh, Giles Martin have said that, you know, people who want the uh, rooftop concert on the CD said it, it's, it's not as interesting as actually seeing them play it. And then, and then there's something to that, I think. I mean, because the full rooftop concert's been bootlegged. We know what it's like. It's not that interesting. You know, I mean, what what Michael Lindsay Hogg did, cutting it down to 20 minutes, getting rid of a lot of the stuff in between getting, you know, choosing only one performance of each song makes it a lot more like a concert than it really was. It was really an outdoor recording session in the freezing cold, you know, um, with people out on the street who could hear them and on adjoining rooftops. But it wasn't really a concert, you know, Um And I think, you know, when we see it, it'll be exciting because we're seeing it happen, but, you know, just hearing it on audio only, not as interesting. So I'm, I'm happy that it wasn't included here. I, I I think there's plenty of other stuff that should have been, but um, I, I don't miss it. And I, I, cause I, cause I know we're going to get it on video and uh, you know, you can make your own CD from the video if you want to, if you really have to have it on CD. Um, I personally haven't really burned a CD in years. Have you guys? Yes, every yeah. day. <laughs> really? No, no, but that's yeah. logistics. It's logistics. I don't have the equipment, but ah. again, I'm still somewhat old school with all of this stuff. And, you know, I got to have this, you know what I'm saying, in my hand or it's not there. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting what you said, Alan, you know, everybody looks at this as their last concert, you know, and um, I wonder how the Beatles themselves envisioned this because 
you know, uh, sorry for repeating this, but they only did a handful of songs. And who knows, had they not been interrupted by the police, would they have just kept doing the same songs over and over again? You don't really know how much they were prepared to do. Yeah. Um, a lot of the stuff that they were rehearsing were slow songs, you know, like Let It Be and The Long and Winding Road, which wouldn't have worked on an Apple rooftop, you know? Right. Right. Um, sometimes you wonder there's there's such a big debate about the song the song All Things Must Pass because the Beatles did rehearse it quite a bit. I've even seen a quote from George Harrison where he felt that you know a lot of his songs were rushed by the group and they gave like a you know pardon the word shitty performance and he probably felt that they wouldn't have given a, a decent performance of of the song. A lot of people wonder why the Beatles didn't release All Things Must Pass and do a proper version of it. And that's, you know, that's subject for debate. But um, you, how do you look at the, you know, that Apple rooftop? Was it really a concert or was it more? How did you word it? <laughs> it was a it was a session. It was a recording session. It was a recording session. Yeah. In the cold. yeah, it was sort of a hybrid, let's say. You know, the concert okay. without an audience sitting right in front of them with stopping and doing retakes, you know, it's, uh, with, um, you know, a lot of looseness in between playing God Save the Queen for a couple of seconds. It was more like a recording session than a concert, I think. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to call it the rooftop concert if, since that's the common parlance for it. But, but the reality was it was really a recording session under fairly disagreeable conditions, given what Ken Mansfield told us about how cold it was when he was on right. the other year. So, okay. Hmm. So we got four more recordings to talk about, and that's what's on the EP. There is the 1970 Glenn Johns mix of Across the Universe, which actually does have Lizzie Bravo and Galen Pease in there for their harmony vocals. Mm -hmm. So it's very similar in sound to the version that we've known from past masters and the charity album for the world wildlife album but um is there anything that you heard in that version that's different alan not really i mean i like i like that sort of comparatively bare version that's also on the, the, there's something like it on let it be naked and there's another one like it on uh, anthology i think three um i i think um i think in its original form without all you know the overdubs and things uh it it was uh it was a nice little track. I like the, you know, the sitar and all there were the, the, the tambora drone. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to have it. I mean, you know, Glenn Johns with some of these things, well, that and I mean, mine didn't really know exactly what they were going to do because this now, this now violated the original mission of the get back slash let it be project, you know, to go get a studio recording, first of all, and then with I Me Mine, a new studio recording that had overdubs and things like that. Uh, with I Me Mine, I mean, to be um, uh, fair to Phil Spector for a change, <laughs> I think Phil Spector did a good job with, you know, because basically what Glenn Johns gave us was sort of the raw take as it was like what a minute 32 seconds or something like that like really right. short way too short to be a song i mean it could have been that way on plea on the please please me album or something but but not now um and or now being 1969 70 uh and he did a little specter did some looping extending it into a much more reasonable length and i didn't mind the overdubs, you know, he did on that one, that, that, that track sounds really, really good. And his version, I think actually is better than the, the, you know, minute and a half that Glenn Johns gave us. Um, but yet I think that Glenn, is how the Beatles recorded it. So it, it's how the Beatles how recorded it. And he may have still been taking seriously their idea that they didn't want to edit and overdub and all that stuff. And so he didn't loop it. You know, I'm sure he's as capable of looping it as Spectre was. He just mm -hmm. probably felt, okay, this is 
this is the song as they've given it to me. It's not my job to, uh, you know, be the artist's producer, you know, like Spectre thought he was, you know, and, uh, and so he left it. Okay, Darren, any comments? Um, basically kind of repeating what I was saying with the, the Let It Be album, disc one, the new mix. They're really, they sound really good, very present, but uh, uh, nothing like eye-opening if you're looking for nuances that are different or anything like that. Oh. Uh, I, I kind of skimmed those, um, not expecting to hear any, you know, differences. So, uh, and on, on a passive listen, nothing really jumped out at me more. Just the odd, just the physical oddness. Is that a word, oddness? Yes. Mr. Oddness, uh, the, the oddness of having a four song EP on a CD right smack in the middle of a big box set. Mm. Uh, was kind of like crazy occupying my attention more than what was actually on the disc. Mm -hmm. I kind of agree with what Alan's saying, although I do like the stripped down, <clears throat> stripped down version of I Me Mine, but yeah, I prefer what Phil Spector did. It's just nice to hear the song without hearing strings and horns. And yeah, it always bothered me when it was that short to begin with. It really deserves to be, but was it? two minutes 20 seconds like it like it was on the let it be album so we still have don't let me down the 2021 single mix i don't notice that big a difference but i like the chatter in the very beginning mm -hmm. uh paul actually says what have you got up your sleeve john don't <laughs> let me down bloody good one don't let me down blues so but it sounds very much like the released version so close mix wise to me anyway yeah did you hear any differences I didn't. <laughs> well, that's the new one for Don't Let Me Down. And the Let It Be 2021 single mix, I heard more organ in the beginning. And I felt the drums were heavier. That's what I picked up in my ears. But anything on your part, Alan or Darren? Again, I mean, I didn't give it the intention that mm. I gave uh, the, the full album. Uh, but there was nothing on on a on a, uh, a passive listen that really made me jot any notes down. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I guess this is like a little bonus. These four tracks, although it's taken up a CD. So. Uh, and what yeah. Alan said early in the show, I you know my name. Look up the number should should have been on there mm. because it was absorbed into the whole Let It Be thing by being a B side uh to the title track right and i'm glad to see don't let me down as part of this as it should be it's such a big part of the sessions they did so many takes and they performed it live but it was never on the original album right right so um yeah and i think i said in a previous show maybe there might have been some reasoning behind that and that don't let me down was on the hey jude album so Maybe they didn't want to release it right after that on the Let It Be album. But, um, and at some point I'd love to know, and maybe you might know, Alan, at what point did it become apparent that they were going to put Across the Universe into this package? Because in some ways, the Let It Be album, while it was a lot of new stuff, they still cobbled it together. You know, there was some patchwork here and bringing back one after 909, which I'm certainly glad they did, taking an old song and resurrecting it. But at some point, they had to decide we got to put across the universe in there. Maybe they didn't have enough material for the album. Yeah, I, I think it was um, very early 1970, you know, around, around the same time that they realized that they needed I Me Mine, <clears throat> but they felt that they could get the 68 take and do something with it. <laughs> because the thing is that they weren't really, they, they weren't really sure they could get John to come in and re record it, you know? Mm. You know, John was off doing his even he wasn't even at the I Me Mind session. He was in Denmark, um, you know, right. and if, if they felt he was necessary or that he would do it or whatever, they could have waited for him to come back. But they didn't, you know. Um, so I think they I think they realized that with um, uh, Across the Universe, 
it would be better to just go back and do something with the existing take um, mm -hmm. than to than to try to redo it. And I love what Phil Spector did with the song, but at the same time, I have to admit, I love those stripped down versions too, like you do, Alan. Yeah. There's several yeah. now that have come out and it's, it's stunningly beautiful by itself, mm -hmm. you know? Mm. All right, so I think we've covered just about everything. Um, any, anything else you wanna add and any, you know, criticism or any praise you wanna give that you haven't said already? I only wonder what's next, because there's going to be something else. Now we've got to the end of the discography. Uh, will they be going back? Mm -hmm. Are we oh. going to see box sets of the earlier material in some fashion? Or uh, is it going to be done for anniversaries? Uh, I'm very curious to see where they go from here. Once Sgt. Pepper was done, everyone was like, oh, but you got to do the White Album, did mm. the White Album, and then Abbey Road, and, and everyone was expecting Let It Be. What's next? So we see. Uh, I'm very curious about where, where the, because they're not stopping. Right. Yeah. Well, Giles Martin uh, threw a, a sort of, you know, well, it's sort of like the opposite of red herring in a way, but, but you know, it's something into the mix there saying that uh, the things before Pepper are, uh not really remixable um and i don't think he's right there and i think he may have been just maybe just trying to put everyone off the scent you know or maybe he really feels that i don't know um but uh i, I sort of yeah I, I don't know i I'd, I'd like to see them go all the way back to please please me and work forward but part of me also would like to see revolver next you know Revolver is something that I think could benefit from a remix. And, you know, because they also had the same kind of, um, you know, stuff that happened during Pepper with copying down and freeing up tracks and all of that, there, there, may, be, there may be a lot there to work with, you know, so we'll see. And who said these box sets have to have a remix in them? They right. could just be, you know, a collection of outtakes. That's right. For me, the outtakes are more important mm -hmm. for me personally. But I can yeah. tell you my theory as to what's going to happen next. Mm. And I might have said it already here on this show. But I do believe that the next box set, and I have no inside information about this, is going to be a Magical Mystery Tour Yellow Submarine one. Because mm. it's pretty obvious that they completely omitted those songs. And it's all within these same years that we're covering with the box sets. When Sgt. Pepper came out, well, why didn't they put only a Northern song in there if it was done at that time period? Mm -hmm. Same thing with um, All Together Now and It's All Too Much. That could have been part of Sgt. Pepper. The same period, you know, right. while they were recording Sgt. Pepper, they mm -hmm. could have done that. And how can you put, um, you know, bonus material of Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields forever on Sgt. Pepper and leave out the rest of Magical Mystery Tour. You know, you can't, it's, it's ridiculous to, to omit that. Um, well, that, that wouldn't have fit on the Sgt. Pepper box set, but I'm just saying that it only makes sense to me that that was done intentionally. There has to be a reason why they did that. So not only that, but Bruce Spizer just put out a book about those two releases, Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine. And usually when he puts out a book, it coincides with a box set, although this would be pretty premature. Um, but that could just all be because of COVID delaying everything. So to me, it makes perfect sense that the next thing we'd see would be Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine. And then if they are concerned about anniversaries, if next year we have Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine, that in 2023, we could have a 60th anniversary, please, please me, and with the Beatles and do everything, you know, work your way up to Revolver every single year. So that's okay. what I personally think is going to happen, but I could be totally wrong. But if I'm right, remember that I said it right here. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the record. <laughs> okay. So why don't we wrap things up by uh, giving all of our viewers and listeners 
our contact information, tell them what we're doing, what you're doing, mm -hmm. Darren. Uh, I'm just sitting here right now, uh, <laughs> chatting with you guys now. Uh, listen to me on WFUV, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday nights at 10 p.m. And Saturday afternoons at 1 p.m. till 4. And for those of you who are watching this um, on Friday the 15th or Saturday or Sunday, uh, WFUV's fall membership drive is going on. And uh, it will last until midnight Sunday night. That would be October 17th. And uh, you can make a contribution and become a member. Um, the easiest thing to do, go to WFUV.org to find out all you need to know about supporting WFUV and, and membership. Um, but anyway, my shows, again, Monday through Thursday nights, 10 o'clock, Saturday afternoon, at one and uh, in fact Saturday's show will be a fundraiser um, and if you want to send me an email uh, uh, email me at WFUV it's my name Darren DeVivo at WFUV.org or look for me on Facebook I've got two pages just you know search Darren DeVivo and uh, you could friend me on the personal page or follow me on uh, on the other page very good, sir. Do both. I try to keep the content different. Okay. Alan, how about you? Okay. Um, what am I doing? I don't know. Um, I'm working <laughs> on, we're starting on volume two of uh, McCartney <laughs> Legacy. Um, I've reviewed Let It Be for the Wall Street Journal. I'd like to think it'd be out tomorrow, but something tells me it won't be because I didn't get lots of editorial emails today. Um, but it should be out pretty soon. And um, yeah, so uh, you can reach me at Facebook uh, as either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. And you can reach all of us by email at things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Uncommonly long name, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We have a Twitter feed at things we said fab. Um, and we have a couple of Facebook pages, things we said today, Beatles radio fans, and just plain old things we said today. Um, you can find the shows on YouTube. You can get them on Podbean, an audio version on Podbean, um, uh, iTunes, basically lots of places where quality podcasts can be found. And um, I think that's it for me. Okay. I just wrote down, and I have to put this in my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, October 15th, 2022, the McCartney legacy. <laughs> it's now going to stay there on my website. But uh, yeah, you know, I just remembered something in theory with what I was saying about Magical Mystery Tour on Yellow Submarine. Hey Bulldog was recorded at the same time as Lady Madonna. Mm -hmm. And yet that wasn't in the White Album box set. But Lady Madonna was. Hmm. And the Inner Light was. So why is there this glaring omission for the, for the Yellow Submarine material? Interesting. So, you may you be know, onto something. Uh, I think so. Anyway, um, on my website, KenMichaelsRadio.com, every single week is Beatles Trivia where you can win one of 10 great prizes, books, CDs, DVDs. Be sure to visit my Beatles trivia and games page at KenMichaelsRadio.com. I've been a little bit busy. Hope to get busier with my YouTube uh, channel, Ken Michaels Radio. Just interviewed Charles Rosnay, who has been a longtime friend of all of ours, was the publisher of Good Day Sunshine, organized a lot of Beatle conventions in New England, Beatle trips to England every single year since 1983. He just put out a book of uh, top 10 horror lists. He's a big horror fan, and he's interviewed a lot of celebrities to give him his list of favorite horror films and actors and monsters and all that kind of stuff. But he also did a Fab Five show with me, uh, which is when he picks five albums, one Beatles, one from each solo Beatle that are the ones he listens to the most today. And I also did another interview with John Borak who is the author of, do I have it here? Yes, I do. 
the Beatles 100, 100 pivotal moments in Beatle history. And um, the reason why I did another interview with him is because he's one of the writers for Goldmine Magazine. He's also a drummer. He's in four different bands right now, one of which is a Beatles tribute band called Let It Be, ironically. And um, he did an article, he wrote an article recently on his top 10 uh, Ringo drumming performances in the Beatles. So I had him talk about that on my YouTube channel and try to play some of that on his drum kit. So if you can, visit Ken Michaels Radio and please subscribe. And don't forget about my other podcast, bi-weekly show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. The most recent show, we did a review of Sometime in New York City. Very controversial album, politically charged album from John and Yoko and the band Elephant's Memory. That is on our Facebook page. It's also on YouTube. And Talk More Talk is on just about every single platform you can name. Um, iHeartRadio, Spotify, you name it. So if you can, check out that show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And for our YouTube channels, please subscribe to all of them for Talk More Talk, for Things We Said Today, and Ken Michaels Radio. And I think that just about covers everything. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation about the Let It Be box set and go out there and get it. It's a lot of great material on there. It's a primer. It's a teaser. It's getting us all ready for what's about to happen the end of November there. I can't wait to see this, uh, this documentary. Just from the four minute trailer, it looks tantalizing. So for Alan Cozen and Darren DeVivo, I'm Ken Michaels thanking all of you for joining us. And we will see you next time. Take care.